pursuit of happiness. See, Max and his friends believe that that omnipotent power should be government. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that. So my promise to you is that I'm not going to harm you. The President's health care bill cut Medicare by half a trillion dollars. Last year, the debt ceiling deal. You remember that debate? The debt ceiling deal? You know why I didn't vote for that? I had voted, I had voted uh, through the cut, cap, and balance bill to raise the debt ceiling, but to put limits on government cut spending, to cap spending, and to have a balanced budget. And that bill would have done everything we needed it to do. But the other bills that were put up there for us to vote on did not do that. And let me tell you what that bill did. It created a super committee. Yeah, wasn't that a farce? <laughs> a super I think it was a farce. But it's exactly what the president wanted to be created. And why did he want it created? Because inside of it, if the super committee could not reach an agreement, which I knew they could, it called for another half a trillion dollars in cuts, except this time it came from defense. So after the health care bill cut Medicare by half a trillion dollars, now there's another half a trillion dollars coming in cuts in defense. There's some more Medicare cuts that were inside of, the, of, of, of that bill. Another $150 billion in cuts to Medicare. So I voted no. And the president was very clear in his promise that if Congress tries to do anything to go around sequestration or those cuts, that he would veto it. So he's dem he is adamant. We're going to cut DOD by half a trillion. And we're going to cut Medicare again by $150 billion. I will fight the president. So I think that what we have to do going forward is we have to say, I'm not interested in what people say. I'm interested in what people do. I'm interested in what people do. Uh, and my, my promise is that uh, uh, we have made our calls and we've made our, our promise because we don't want politics as usual. Politics of destruction, having to tear somebody else down to build yourself up. To me, that's a sign of a real character flaw. Well, let me tell you this. You can't build anything strong without character. Character. Susan and I have been married 25 years. We started first grade together. We've been together our whole life. That doesn't happen without character. That doesn't happen without honesty and dialogue. So politics, I understand. It's a nasty thing. But it's more nasty than it should be. And it's more nasty than the American people should have you to, to do it. You want to talk about ideas. Now, you know, one of the things that, um, that as far as ideas, regarding the health care bill, we've got, you know, just, just repealing a bill or, or saying that and if the Supreme Court, which we saw last week, hear this, the case of, uh, of health care, it's not enough for the Supreme Court just to rule a law unconstitutional and that law go away. There's a problem that needs to be solved. The American people need to have access to affordable health care. They, they, uh, there's people here with pre-existing conditions that need health care. Can't get it. But what we've got to have is we've got to have individuals on both sides of the aisle be able to communicate together. What's the problem? Let's find a solution, not a deal. Well, unfortunately, um, uh, that dialogue did not occur in the, in the health care bill that was passed. Because if it did occur, it would have some things in it as a replacement that would allow competition. I'll give you an example. Prices, as you know, are regulated and become more reasonable with competition. perfect example is the Panama City Airport. Now, you know, before the airport, Delta was the only airlines that flew in and out of Panama City. And if you ever had the, the fortune to be able to fly out of the airport and only have one airline to choose from, you know that you paid more money for a plane ticket to fly from here to, say, Washington, D.C. than you should have had to have paid for. But when the new airport opened up, amazing thing happened. Southwest came to town. 
and Delta found Jesus. <laughs> they got religion. So now, as a result of competition, Delta is more than competitive. Now, did they lower their prices because they liked you? No. Or they, no. They understood that supply and demand. Supply and demand. And that you would vote with your dollar. And that when you had two choices, the prices were cheaper, but they also had to develop and provide service. They had to be polite. They had to be efficient. They couldn't destroy your bags. They want to make sure you get a beverage. They want to make sure you get some snacks. They want to make sure that hopefully they're on time. Okay? And so therefore, competition was a good thing. So in the, in the health care bill going forward, whatever it is replaced with, it needs to stimulate competition across state lines. There's some other things that need it. It, it, it badly needs some tort reform. Okay? With doctors under the threat of being sued and sued and sued and sued and sued and sued, you can't blame a doctor for ordering tests that he knows there's a great chance he's going to have to present in court. That he did a, as much as he could to diagnose the problem. Okay? So therefore, instead of ordering two tests, which would be adequate, he has to order eight. And when you order eight, that's going to cost the American people more. And also, it's going to slow down the process. It's like, it's like injecting kudzu into the practice of medicine. Another thing that I think needs to happen is this. You know, currently, corporations are allowed to, uh, to deduct their insurance costs in their taxes. So when they file their corporate tax return, they can deduct the insurance premiums that they paid for their employees. But currently, individuals cannot. I think that is a discrepancy in the tax code that's not fair. I think that when an individual family, let's say you're, a, you're working, but your employer doesn't have a, a, a health care plan for their employees, that when you purchase a health care plan, you should be able, as an individual, to deduct those health care premiums on your personal tax return. So that's a change that I think needs to occur, that people are treated fairly and equally uh, and do not, uh, do not get penalized for having to provide health care themselves for their family and not receive that deduction on their taxes. There's another thing that I think is very important, and that is that I believe doctors who provide benevolent care to those who do not have insurance should be able also to deduct that, like many companies do. There's a lot of private companies that are allowed. Small businesses. When I say companies, I'm talking about, I'm talking about small businesses, which my family owns, small businesses. If you do, you, know, you give to a, a non-profit, uh, a charitable organization, you give back to your community, you know you can deduct that on your taxes. But doctors can't. They're not allowed. So therefore, when they provide service to someone who doesn't have insurance or doesn't have the ability to pay, they have to take it out of their own pocket with no benefit to them. As a matter of fact, they're penalized for doing the right thing. They're penalized for providing care. That's wrong. That needs to be fixed. So those are just a couple things that nowhere, nowhere, in the health care bill that was, is argued before the Supreme Court last week, does that bill allow for those things that I just mentioned? And that's not proper. So going forward, going forward, we've got to make sure that we uh, incorporate some of these ideas if we really want to keep the cost of health care. And, and the more affordable health care is, the more accessible it will be. So uh, that's a big issue. Now, I want to... Um, I want to make I want to make light of um, of, of and, I, and I outlined some of uh, some of these things that uh, you know we had a we had a payroll um, you know we had a, 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 a payroll tax deduction bill over the last few months that we fought one of the single greatest things to me in the bill that I voted for and the reason I voted for it was again back to Medicare if you see that last point it said I voted to increase doctor reimbursement rates. 
ensuring that Medicare beneficiaries continue to receive quality care they deserve. Had the payroll bill not been passed, the doctors would have felt a 27% cut in Medicare reimbursements. So, to be consistent that I am not going to harm our seniors, I said, we've got to pass this bill. Because what happens when a doctor has a 27% cut in Medicare reimbursement? He stops seeing Medicare. He stops seeing Medicare. And so to be consistent to my promise and my pledge to you, I voted for that bill because it prevented our doctors from taking that cut and it made it more affordable for them And because they have to run their business. They've got nurses, they've got a business, they've got electricity, they've got costs that they have to pay for. So I, we prevented that. And that provision uh, prevents that cut for at least two years. So for two years... We've eliminated that possibility. Now, I'm not happy with two years. It needs to be longer. Uh, but that was debated, and that's what was, uh, uh, was, was decided on. Melissa, let's go back. I want to mention a couple things before I take questions. I want to mention a couple things that I think were, uh, are terribly important. This right here, uh, we're going to continue to talk about. Because this right here is the single greatest threat that we have to America's future. Currently, our national debt stands at around 16, close to 16 trillion. But as current spending, as we go through the end of the year, by the end of the year, we will be around um, 16 trillion dollars, uh, a little over 16.3, 16.4. In February alone, February is the smartest, the, the shortest month of the year. February alone, your federal government racked up the highest deficit ever recorded by a government in one month in human history. $225 billion deficit. Yes? <coughs> See, but most people don't realize what a trillion dollar is. <laughs> I, I think you ought to tell people along the way, a good way to remember it is uh, spend $16 million a day since Jesus Christ was born, you still have 700 years to spend 16 3. 700 years of spending $16 billion a day? $16 million, 16 million a day? Right. right. Since Jesus Christ was born, right. Right. you still have 700 years to spend right. 16 3. Right. Now, I want to be very fair, even to people that are trying to, trying to harm me. I want to be very fair. <clears throat> I'm not happy with the spending trends under any of the last two administrations. Okay, because under the previous administration, okay, yeah. we sp the, the money that was spent was not responsible. You see, there's right and there's wrong. Absolutely. And so I have a real issue with how government grew and the level in which government grew under the previous administration. Now, it has gone to another warp speed in the last three years. But it, it wasn't good. It wasn't proper. It wasn't responsible. It wasn't fiscally responsible in how it was spent uh, prior to that. So what we want to do is, regardless of party, regardless of political, we want to do the right thing. And the right thing is to spend only that which you have. Absolutely. The right thing is let's don't borrow more money, and out of every dollar we spend, 50 cents of that dollar is borrowed, and much of the borrowing is done from countries who don't really like us, who don't really care for us, who don't believe in human rights. I certainly don't believe in the, the God that our forefathers believed in who gave us those rights, who they made reference to four times in the Declaration of Independence. We believe in God. We believe in nature's rules. Nature's laws and nature's God. We as Judeo-Christian Americans believe in that. So, in this right here, you'll see some things that really are bothersome. Point number one, the president's budget for 2013, the one that he just put on our desk about a month ago, has inside of it the fourth consecutive trillion dollar deficit. Now, 
President Barack Obama said in 2009, we are going to cut the deficit and the debt, or excuse me, we're going to cut the debt in half. And that's a lot. <laughs> I'll let you talk to Max when this is over. See if they see if they run that on the TV. Um, uh, the problem is, 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 is that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. Okay. Um, one of the problems that I have in, in Washington D.C. There's no sense of urgency. You know, there's sense of urgency here in Calvin County. Yeah. There's sense of urgency around all 16 of my counties. There's sense of urgency all over America. But there's no sense of urgency in Washington D.C. But I got to tell you, it drives me nuts, and there's a sense of urgency in my life because our family's in small business. This is our home. Our family's lived in this district for over 200 years. We know this district, and we know there's a sense of urgency in every home, in every small business, in every county commission and city commission. There's a sense of urgency because you're being asked to do more with less, while the federal government is doing more with more. When I mean more, they're, 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 they're growing more. They're not doing more productive, you know, productive things, but they are doing more. They're growing more. And it's because of this. If we gave the president what he asked for in his budget request, and a budget, a budget request by a president is a 10-year projection of his vision. Of his vision. Well, the president's vision, the president's desire is that by 2022, we would have spent almost $50 trillion as a nation. By that time, our debt, which now stands at $16 trillion, will grow at the president's, at the president's uh, pace, will grow to almost $26 trillion. It's grown over $5 trillion since the president promised to cut it in half. Now, and that's with him wanting to perform in such a way that he's reelected. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a second term knowing that he's done? Wow, that's scary. Uh, also, you'll see uh, by 2022, we will have paid almost $6 trillion in interest alone. Interest alone. Now, I was raised in a Christian home. And I'm proud for our, our friends to, uh, uh, to publicize that, okay? Because I'm proud of that. I was raised in a home where we were taught, Proverbs says that the, the, the borrower will be slave to the lender. Absolutely. I believe that. I don't believe that's just God's <coughs> word. I believe that's common sense. Yeah, common sense. Yeah. Okay? Now, with us spending this kind of money and us borrowing 50 cents of every dollar that we spend, you take that verse and you apply America to that, you apply it to our spending, America will be slave to who? China. China, certainly. Whatever we're getting the money from. So the point is, is, that's not Republican, Democrat, Independent. That's just common sense. We don't want that. We don't need that. Okay? So I'm going to continue to talk about that and many other things that I think you want to know about. And I think that concerns you. Because the problem is, is we can't continue this insane economic policy and then be able to give you the services that you need and that Congress is supposed to provide for you according to the Constitution. That's a pesky little document to some in leadership in Washington. It's a pesky little document, I think, to the President. You know, we saw the President get involved in the Libyan conflict and he never even sent an email to Congress. I think Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution clearly says okay, that, that the President has a requirement to communicate with us also in accordance to the 1973 War Powers Act. You know, in a, in a difficult economic time, when, we're, when we're, we're committing bombs that cost millions upon millions upon millions of dollars, Okay, then I think that the president should let us know. And, uh, and I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I, I support it in a bipartisan effort with Democrats in the House that uh, we were able to, to, to really 
express our anger that the Constitution was ignored. Yes, if it does violate the Constitution, why hasn't he been impeached? Well, I think this. Regarding that topic, I think that if, if we want to change our president, then we have the best opportunity to do that in November. We now are, we now are, are, are in April, okay? Uh, I, I think that uh, the American people, uh, the ball's in your court. And I will say this, that we speak with greater clarity for the world. We speak with greater announcement to the world that the government is here to serve the people. The people are not here to serve the government. And you haven't been getting the service that you deserve. And so I think that in November, and I think that the news for the White House is very bad. That's why we're seeing time and time and time again the president act in such a way that kind of gives you a glimpse that they're getting bad news. When the president of the United States, the head of the executive branch, takes a shot at the judicial branch like he did two days ago and takes a shot at the Supreme Court justices and basically criticizes the balance of power and basically says and criticizes them for being activists those non-elected individuals, some of whom he appointed, to criticize them from one branch of government to the other. Act sounds like a little bit more like a king than a president. He also does a good job of criticizing Congress. He does. Well, let me say this. He's quick to, he, because he ignores the, the, the founding fathers' uh, creation of branches of government, he's quick to say the Republican Congress. He's, he's ignoring the truth, isn't he? What is the truth about Congress? It's split. It's split. And, uh, and, and there's another body over there. What is that? The Senate. It's the Senate. And who controls that? Democrats. And uh, do you know that it's been over a thousand days since they have produced a budget? They didn't produce a budget in 2010, 2011, 2012. And Harry Reid announced last month that he has no intention. In spite of that financial crisis, he has no intention of putting forth a budget for 2013. The president's own budget request, when brought before the Senate, there were 97 senators on the floor that day. Do you know what the vote was? 97 to 0, the president's own budget was defeated. Harry Reid himself didn't even vote for the president's budget. The most liberal senators in D.C. did not vote for the president's budget. So last week, we, the House, had a shot at being able to vote on the president's budget. There were 415 members of the House on the floor that day that voted. You want to guess what the vote was? 414 to zero. 414 to zero. Not a single member of the House of Representatives. That is just... So... Not Nancy Pelosi, not Barney Frank, not, not Henry Waxman, the most liberal individuals in the House of Representatives, Steny Hoyer, none of them voted for the President's budget. So in both chambers, not a single vote. So my question to you is this. Who is out of touch with the American people? Everybody, it appears, <laughs> because we can't play. come to a consensus in either House or the Senate or the Democrats or the Republicans. We can't well, come is, together to do the people's work. I would agree. Now, there is a process that our founding fathers put in place. One is that the House would come up with their version. And I'm talking about the legislative branch. The House would come up with their version. The Senate would come up with their version. And then it would go to con it would go to a con what they call a conference, and the leaders of both houses would appoint conferees, and then those individuals would go into debate, debate, and they would hammer out both bills, and they would find a compromise. Yeah. Okay. And then that bill would be brought before us for a final vote, like we did in the FAA bill, to keep our airlines all moving and our airports moving. We did that. So the process we know works, and it even works with a Republican House and a Democratic Senate. But what Harry Reid is doing, Harry Reid is tabling our bills and not allowing them up for a vote, or he's not creating an option, another 
proposal on the Senate side. So we can't get bills to conference. Deadlock. Well, we're doing our part. Have you ever played tennis and you get out there and you, you hit tennis balls the other side and you never got one back in return? I kind of feel that way. How about a football team that goes and opening kickoff, they kick off and there's nobody down there and there's nobody running the ball back. That just, you got to want to play ball. You got to want to play ball in order to produce product that the American people deserve. I'm aggravated by this. I'm aggravated by, by czars. Okay, and czars were a thing that, that had been used in both, both sides, Republicans and Democrats. I don't like that. I think that circumvents us knowing about the people that we're putting in agencies and to oversee the people's work. I, I don't like it. I don't think it's right. I don't think it is uh, uh, what we need to be doing. And um, so we're going to, you know, I think there's right and wrong. And there's things in this stuff right here. This isn't Republican or Democrat. It's just math. Right. It's just math. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Admiral Mullen, and then I'm going to answer your questions. Admiral Mullen, um, who was the president, uh, his, his selection uh, to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Some of you may remember this comment back in 2010. I think the biggest threat we have to our national security is our debt. Absolutely. Now, he didn't say, I think, a big threat, a concerning threat, a growing threat. I mean, he went straight to the biggest threat, to our national security. He didn't say, he didn't say terrorism, or he didn't say Al-Qaeda, or the Taliban, or you know, our, 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 our challenges in Iraq or Afghanistan. He didn't say a, a nut job in Iran, Ahmadinejad, who's pursuing nuclear proliferation with the threat of wiping off Israel from the face of the map. He didn't say him. He didn't say uh, the president of, I mean, the, the head of North Korea in his pursuit, his testing of long-range missiles that would deliver a warhead uh, to American soil. He didn't even say that. The head of our military, the head of our defense said that our biggest challenge and biggest threat is right here. Our national debt. Our national debt. So we put forth a plan, a plan that you're going to hear a lot of criticism, a plan that, 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 that makes the, uh, the, uh, the tax code simpler and easier to understand, that closes loopholes that needs to be closed, that shrinks the tax code down to two brackets, that lowers the corporate tax rate. Because right now, in the world, China, I mean, excuse me, Japan dropped their corporate tax rate. We now have the highest tax rate, almost 40% tax rate, the highest in all of the developed world. Does that make corporations want to come here? Let me ask you this. Do corporations want to come here and fight all the regulations? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Under the president's leadership, the department's, have rolled out over 10,000 rules in three years, smothering ingenuity, creativity, production. They're killing us. They're killing us. And they're doubling down. The EPA is doubling down. It is their goal that we never, never have access to the world's largest reservoir of natural resources. This doesn't have to be. This doesn't have to be. You know what we've got to do? We've got to be smart. We've got to access you know, projects like the Keystone Pipeline. It makes sense. That are better for the environment than, than Canada building a pipeline over the Canadian Rockies, pumping that crude into the belly of tankers, letting them navigate dangerous seas, and deliver that oil to a country called China. Oh, they've got a really good environmental <laughs> history. They're building a coal plant a week while this administration is doing everything they can to close down every coal plant and to ensure that our gas prices continue to rise and be equivalent to those of Europe. And that would be 8 and $9. The president wants to brag about uh, oil production. Really? You know, I sit on natural resources. And the Natural Resources Committee, we oversee 
uh, permitting for oil exploration. You know what takes eight years for a permit that has been issued to produce energy? Eight years. Hmm. So the president wants to brag on oil production. So who is he praising when he does that? The one he usually blames. <laughs> the one he usually blames. Because none of the oil production that we're getting today is because of Barack Obama. It is because of the previous administration and the permits that were issued under George Bush's administration. And much of the oil that is being produced today uh, that, that uh, is being produced on private lands in North and South Dakota. So I think that the president is being um, less than truthful when he claims that under his watch, you know, all the, the oil, that he is responsible for the oil production that has been occurring in this country. Yes, sir. Steve, I'd like to thank you for making yourself available to us on, on this type of basis. So sure. Can, see you one to one. Thank you. you this, this, it's easier to see you than it is our state senator of the county. Uh, the last meeting I went to years was on farm bill at the Marion. Right. I learned something every time that I go to these meetings. I appreciate that. Thank you. And on the subject of your, your town hall meetings, um, uh, do, do you post your schedule for your town hall meetings on your website? Any chance? The reason I ask that is I, I found out about this meeting two days ago from Numbers USA. Mm -hmm. And then only yesterday it was in the local paper. Right. Um, is, is it posted on your website? Well, the um, uh, I think it is posted on yeah, our press release. Yeah, yeah. It's posted on our website. We email it out. Which part? Um, That's on the homepage? It's out there on our homepage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matt McCullen, who is our communications director, he sends out press releases. I mean, ha I mean, that's how Mac com Max comes to, to our town hall meetings because they're following everything I'm doing. Remember? So, uh, uh, and, and let me say this: Max may be a little late. He probably slept a little late last night, uh, but because uh, we're dragging him all over the 16 counties, and uh, uh, it's hard for him sometimes to catch up to us. Uh, we don't sleep late because we work for a living, and we know that when the sun comes up, we got to be running. Uh, I've told people that you know about our life that uh, we love to uh, we love forty hour work weeks. That's why we squeeze two into every seven day period. There you go. Uh, so uh, we're going to he's he's going to get in shape over the next five six months because we're going to run him like a dog. Um, but um, we try to we, we, we let the media know. Uh, we do uh, uh, from time to time we, we do phone messages. We we call out and so yeah, we, that's I, that's that's what I was going to bring up. Steve. Yeah. Is uh, that's how I found out that you was going to have a meeting here today? Right. Was I had on mass machine? Right. Right. Yeah. So we're trying because you just can't build credibility or, or a good relationship without communication. So if sometimes it slips by you, it's certainly not been because we've we've not tried to let you know. Yeah. Maybe you need to explain how 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 do you get on the phone list where you call and leave a message on the telephone. Well, what we can do is we can because sometimes when we when we purchase those numbers. That, 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 that call, uh, what we can do is if, if you're not in that purchased group, uh, we could perhaps add you okay. to that. And so if we know, so I would ask you today, uh, if, if you want to be on those going forward and that there's a chance that you might not be in that purchased number, uh, we'll, we can have a group that we add in to every call and we're happy to do that. So make sure before you leave, and we, we have your contact information. Well, you got mine because that's how I got it. I just put it Good. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a list of questions, but I don't, I don't want to keep anybody up from asking questions. I want to ask one more. Okay. Uh, I've got about four or five here. But on the ethanol mandate, um, you're probably more familiar with that than I am, more than I like, and you can, you can speak on that because I'm not really up on the federal part of it, but I'm really up on the state mandate. Okay. Two years ago, Florida passed the mandate. I'm not going to go into all the details about that, but right now they have passed an energy bill that adds two ethanol subsidies in Florida and out of our pocketbook, and it's going to go right back into uh, messing up our car engine. And somehow our legislature doesn't see the common sense about that. All they can see is here's somebody company wants to uh, put in an ethanol plant and create jobs. Well, those jobs may go belly up in a year or two. Where those jobs are going to go, and they'll go with all our tax money. Um, I, I believe you mentioned this at the Mariana meeting that you've uh, 
some kind of acquaintanceship or friendship with Adam Putnam. I do. Uh, can, can you, number one, can you help us at the federal level to mm -hmm. overcome this thing? And number two, can you help us at the state level? Adam Putnam is one who takes credit for offering the energy bill, the Senate version of the energy bill. Okay. And he seems to be siding with the energy people on this thing right. instead of the consumers. I've asked the people over there, said, where is the consumer represented in our legislature, right. in our in the process? I went over there to, to the last Senate committee on, meeting on that. I was there four hours one day and two hours the next time. It did. They never let anybody speak. Right. I never heard the consumers right. represented in right. the issue. Right. Now, look, I think, uh, first of all, let me address the federal level because that's what I have more act exposure to. Um, you know, we... we um, you know, the, the Agriculture Committee has a large number that sit on that committee that are from the grain states, Iowa, uh, Kansas, uh, and so um, Indiana. Uh, and I think that um, they get it, that, that you know, you're seeing probably more action that you would find approval with on the federal level than perhaps uh, maybe what I've heard you describe on the state level. We understand that... Uh, that is something that, uh, that, that, that is going to have to go away, okay, because of the reasons, Absolutely. you know, the, what the, you know the, the, how it increases food prices, oh, uh, yeah. and it's not good, as you stated, yeah. it's not, not, uh, not the best for our engines. So, so the replacement cost of engines, and, and there's so many other ways. Uh, I'm a big fan of natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think natural mm -hmm. gas is, is good for the environment. Uh, to throw a bone to those who say that I, I'm always against that. I think natural gas is good for the environment. We have an unlimited supply. Uh, we have some of the largest natural gas finds in the world. Uh, it's good for the engines. Uh, uh, it's good for, for the environment. It's good for the environment, and, it, and it's good for the consumer. Because you mentioned oftentimes the consumer gets left out, and so therefore it's good for the consumer because it brings down more affordable you know, ga uh, prices for, for energy. On the state level, uh, so I think you're going to see more. I think you're going to see those continuing to go down and down and down on the federal level. Uh, I think on the state level, I believe that they will follow suit. I think that what you see, maybe not in this session, but I think over time, yeah. I think long term, if, if the federal government, is, if we've got policy, a lot of times that policy trickles down to the states. Well, they've proved this for the next four years. Well, I think that... The government hasn't signed it. No, I understand. I understand. But to answer your question, yes, I'm happy to reach out to the commissioner. I have a very good relationship uh, with Adam Putnam. Uh, as a matter of fact, his legislative director was Karen Williams. She was with him for uh, 10 years. I met Karen. Karen is now our legislative director and has been. And Karen knows more about Florida ag than anyone I've ever met on the Hill. So we have good access to the commissioner's office, and I'll express that concern when I speak to him because we communicate with him regularly. Because I share your concerns. Do you have an inside track with the governor? Well, we communicate with the governor. I will tell you, we communicate with the governor quite often on, um, on, on many issues. But a lot of times when I communicate with the governor, I communicate with him regarding fisheries issues. I, have, you know, I serve on Natural Resources Fisheries Subcommittee. And I am very concerned with what I see the federal government doing to our fishermen along our coast. It's, you know, I grew up in Panama City. I grew up with fishermen. As far as recreational fishermen, I am one. I look forward to going out with my children, just as my father enjoyed going out with me and my siblings. Uh, and the way of life along our coast is being threatened. Why? By an ever-encroaching federal government that is stripping away from our, our fishermen and our, our boats for hire, head boats, the ability to make a living that our grandfathers made, great-grandfathers made. It's a way of life. So when I talk to the governor, oftentimes I'm talking to him. I have limited time with him, so I communicate with him about uh, fisheries. But being on ag, I certainly do not mind taking your concerns and making that a, a quick point to the governor regarding energy. So, um, yes, sir. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Yeah, I've got another. There's one, well, there's one, there's two things that I want to uh, bring to you. I read the paper this morning where the Amtrak thing that yes. you oppose, I uh, I support you 100% on that. I don't think it should be too many things subsidized in this country. And another thing is the incidents that's going on down there in, in uh, Sanford. Uh, I'd like, if you don't have the presidents here, uh, 
Speaker Banner does. Uh, I don't want to be an alarmist, but uh, if if our president is a man that is a, that's supposed to be our president, he needs to stand up to what's going on down there and try to get this thing under control because we fixed to have civil arrest. And it looks to me like that. Yeah. Because this, this is a bad situation. I don't want to be an alarmist, but, but uh, try to bring that to Speaker Boehner's attention and maybe he'll talk to the President. Understood. And I appreciate you coming, Steve. Thank and you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. All right. Quickly, I'll answer those two points. And by my name, anyway, my name's Charles Wood, Steve. Charles Wood. Thank right. you so much, Mr. Wood. And we'd like to make sure you're on that list. Well, yeah, I, 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 I do your telephone calls. I listen to you for about an hour. And then uh, also, uh, you, you call me and let me know that, I, that you was me, going to be here today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, his, uh, as far as the Amtrak, and I'll just say this quickly, uh, I, am, uh, I am a fan of rail. I think that we need rail in this country, not just for people, but also for, for supplies and for cargo, and we need rail. But we have to do what we do in a fiscally responsible manner. And what I'd like to see, so many people ask me about having Amtrak, having Amtrak, having Amtrak. I think we as Americans need to ask Amtrak some serious questions. The American people want rail. American people expect it, need it. So Amtrak, why can't you get your fiscal house in order? Okay? You want it. I cannot, in good faith, with that nightmare of a deficit and debt, I can't say that we're going to put in place a system that for every dollar of ticket sales, they generate two dollars in expenses. So we're, we're paying people to ride the train. We've got to make sure that it is a, a, an enterprise that can meet its own and tote its own and be able to afford its own. Last year alone, Amtrak Food Services lost $60 million in just food. Well, look, that, 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 we can't do that. So I want Amtrak. I believe in rail, and I think it creates opportunity, economic opportunity for our small communities around North Florida if we can get that going. I, I'm, I'm in favor of that, but what I'm not in favor of of giving Amtrak a blank check where they can continue uh, to, to rely on government subsidies uh, to the tune of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of dollars per ticket on that particular rail link from here to New Orleans. We can't do that. So they need to get their fiscal house in order, and then I'm willing to look at that and say, hey, this makes sense. Secondly is regarding uh, the issue in Sanford, and I want to be very, very um, respectful. Anytime that anyone is shot and killed, especially a child, uh, a young person, uh, we've got to pause and we've got to do make sure that, that the law enforcement and, um, uh, and the legal system moves. And I would say when it's a, a situation such as this, I think there's an impetus there to, to move quickly rather than slow. But we, it needs to move. And everyone, I understand, uh, deserves, by our rights, due process. And, uh, and so, uh, I, I, as you know, I don't have a background in law enforcement like some in the room. Uh, I don't have a law degree, uh, so I don't have a degree in jurisprudence. You know, I would just encourage those that are in charge to move swiftly, do your job, prove what the, tr what the truth is, which I don't know. Uh, it would be unfair, as some have weighed in, and, and they've determined truth already. I don't know that, and it would be irresponsible for me to say I know what that was. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to do that. But I, I do encourage uh, those that, first of all, my heart goes out to any family that's involved in this terrible situation, uh, all the families that are involved. And I think that everyone deserves, uh, and I think that those who fan the flames, fan the flames, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that, that, that make their living <laughs> off fanning flames. Uh, and I think that... Uh, uh, everyone will give an account for that one day. So uh, I think that we need to uh, we need to have people that, that are pe leaders of vision, leaders that bring people together rather than trying to, to perpetuate their own selfish needs and desires by dividing. Okay? I know that uh, this is a great country. 
you're great Americans because you came. Some in this room who may agree or may disagree, it's a great country that we can disagree, but when we disagree, we must do so with respect and kindness to enable us to communicate and try to solve problems. We don't have to agree on everything. Because if we did agree on everything, one of us wouldn't be necessary. And I think we're all necessary to find the best solutions for America going forward. Thank you so much for being here today. Please sign up on our new e-newsletter on our website to get our communications. We're going to continue to reach out to you in a desire to make sure that you have greater say in the direction of your government. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much.